All right, thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I was in Belfast maybe 30 years ago. It was quite different then. <laughs> and I was a musician, so that was part of the problem. Uh, so it's a great pleasure. I, uh, I always use the BBC, you know, whenever I speak as an example of, of how you can do good things with public money. Uh, it's amazing because now I live in Switzerland. I was born in Germany. Uh, it's amazing that this keyword that keeps being mentioned all over the world, the keyword is uh, ecosystem, right? how this ecosystem has unfolded here. Uh, and it's pretty mind-boggling to see that uh, we're going in this right direction. And now that Mark has moved over to the New York Times, I hope he is able to bring some of that ecosystem to the New York Times. Uh, good luck to him. Um, so it's really a great pleasure that uh, I can talk to you about this ecosystem. I think that uh, I'm working on a new book. It's called From Ego to Eco. Um, it doesn't have actually much to do with green or environment. It has to do with how the world is shifting from this idea about basically unlimited profit and growth, right, which is what I call an ego system, uh, to the world of ecosystems. Right? And, and even though people make fun of this, you know, when, when we talk about ecosystem, because it sounds sort of like you know, communist California uh, rituals, you know, it's actually all about that. Right? And, and as a futurist, you know, this is really my job is to sort of look at the obvious. It's a Chinese saying, if you want to know about the future, ask your children. Uh, and that's quite obvious. You know, most of my clients, you know, we have hundreds of clients with my company called the Futures Agency in media, technology, publishing, and so on, branding, marketing. It's really obvious that a lot, for a lot of companies, the job is really to look at what's coming that's quite right there, but you don't have time to look at it. I mean, obviously, if you're running companies, you know, you're busy just making it work. You don't have time to think about what's going to happen in three to five years. And that's kind of my job. The motto of my company is, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark. In other words, you know, we are pretty sure that in the next three to five years, there'll be quite a bit of rain. Uh, I'm not sure we'll need an ark, but you know, clearly in media and technology, and you know, if you just look at the music business, what happened to them, I mean, it was totally clear that we're going to need an ark. You know, of course, you know, they, they, uh, they were thinking they should rather buy the ocean instead, but never mind. Uh, it wasn't raining when Noah built the ark, and that's kind of what's happening today. You know, social media, so-called social media, which is a word that we should get rid of because it's really not about Facebook or Twitter or, you know, that's sort of just the top level, right? I call this a social operating system. And uh, the, the key words behind this whole movement of social media are social, local, you know, local services, but also local content, and of course, mobile. Uh, if you're looking at what's happening in this space, it's quite clear to see that um, this issue of uh, being social, local, and mobile is primarily coming down to a really important thing is that the mobile device has become, in a way, our external brain. Uh, this is actually quite scary. I mean, think about this for a second, right? The, uh, the way that we use mobiles now when we have an argument at the bar, we look it up on Wikipedia. Right? If we want to go somewhere, we use the bad Google uh, Apple Maps, you know, whatever, you know, we, we also, we use this device as being our external depository of ideas and, and very soon this will be internal, you know, using internet on our, on our iris or Google glasses or Wikipedia implants, you know, think about that for a second. If I had a Wikipedia implant, I'd be quite advantaged talking to you with all my knowledge that wouldn't come actually for me. But here's a smarter guy than I am, uh, Charlie Rose interviewing Mark Anderson who, uh, Anderson, who actually founded Netscape and, and also as a lead investor in Facebook, and uh, see what he says. There's sound on this, so bring up the sound, please. I think it's, we're, we're, on the, we're on the tipping point. The, the convergence of smartphones, the convergence of uh, social networks, the convergence of online video, like these are the things, these things are happening right now. Um, and most marketing, most marketers, most companies, most agencies are not yet uh, are not yet taken advantage of, are not yet all over the kinds of opportunities that currently exist. Mm. In the next three years, I mean, it's sort of a cliche, but it's actually true. The next three years are going to see more transformation and change than we've probably seen in the last 10 or 15. Mm. Um, and now, So we have reached a takeoff point with social, local, mobile, because mobile devices are now basically what it's all about. I mean, tablets are exploding, as I'm sure you're aware of. And this is a huge shift, not just for the companies that make the tablets. And now you can buy a tablet for $30. Right? Go to India, you can buy an Arakash Android tablet for $31. And tablets could be very well free, like the Kindle may be free in the very near future, but you could buy a tablet for 10 euros or 10 pounds. Right? Think about what that will actually do. The Thai government is now buying tablets to give to people to study for students without printing. 
Think about the, the changes of technology, but also the changes of habits. You know, what does it mean? All of a sudden, as a writer, I can write a Kindle single, so-called, with just 30 pages. That would have never worked in, in print, because you know, how I'm going to print a book for 30 pages wouldn't be worth it. Right? So I'm changing this. Basically, what's happening is that we're seeing this world that used to be all about top-down broadcasting. You know, some people making decisions, the rest of us watching. And that will not go away, of course, to a large degree. But now we have a second world unfolding, the world of peer-to-peer -peer conversation, of people trading stuff, sharing things. Uh, 61 minutes of content uploaded on YouTube, uh, hours, 61 hours uploaded on YouTube every minute. Right? 17 billion pictures, million pictures a day on Flickr. I mean, it's mind-boggling what people do. There are substantial differences between broadcasting and what I call broadbanding. Right? But they make a great couple. So anybody in the television business, the video business, and of course also the music business, eventually, once they get around to seeing reality, uh, anybody in that business actually can make a very good living going forward with that convergence of those two things. I mean, we have a tidal wave of game-changing technologies. If you look at all this stuff, like uh, being able to speak to the television, augmented reality, which sounds like Star Trek, but is quickly becoming sort of a standard. Second screen television, social apps where you can follow the TV and have discussions about what's happening there. All sounds very geeky, but in a few years will become just the standard even for my mother. I mean, if I give her an iPad, which I tried, you know, I couldn't get the internet to work there really well, but she thought it's a television. Right? And she's 77, it's just a television. Right? So mind-boggling stuff, for example, this. Here for Giga on TV, I'm here with Stephen White, the president of Grace Note, company well known in the audio space, but now they're going into content recognition on the TV screen, and Stephen's going to give us a demo of that now. Thanks. So, what I'm going to show you here is Grace Note's uh, automatic content recognition platform. What we're going to do here is we're going to start the application here listening, and it's going to then use audio fingerprinting to identify the content that's happening on the TV. So, let's get this started. So it's now recognized what actors are on the screen and which music's playing, Bananarama, Cruel Summer. How many people here are using their tablet or mobile phone while they're watching television? Let me see some hands. Right. Mind-boggling, right? I mean, this opportunity of identifying what's playing and then showing the cast or the song for the download or the products to buy from the TV show, which would be lesser issue for me, you know, it's kind of distracting, but people do this. I mean, it's mind-boggling what's happening with that data just using audio fingerprinting on the second screen. And so that tidal wave is going to mean that we have lots and lots of new interfaces that are being invented. For example, here is Michio Kaku, who's a scientist, talking about what's happening with the, the Internet. The Internet is going to be in our contact lens. And when the Internet is in our contact lens, you blink and you will go online. And if you meet somebody at a meeting, a conference, or a classroom, and you don't know who they are, your glasses will identify who they are and print out their biography in your contact lens. So you will always... That would be actually reasonable, but, but you know, it's okay. So this, this is something that could be happening. But I mean, uh, culturally speaking, of course, we wouldn't try to take, uh, take to this in the same way that people in Korea would, obviously. But uh, not to say anything against Koreans, they're just different. Right? And here's another thing. That's happening is, of course, television, smart television. Can you sound there? Channel up. Control the TV two. with your voice. Web browser. Black Eyed Peas tour. So you know about all this stuff. I mean, it's, it's basically interesting to see how our behavior is changing. We're going to be talking to computers, we're going to gesture to computers, we're going to pull up data from live television with our hands. And all that sounds like, you know, again, like Star Trek, but remember that only 10 years ago, if I have told you that you can go to top of Mount Everest and make a YouTube video and publish it from the top of Mount Everest, you think I'd gone nuts, right? I did that last week, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, I never make it up there in time, but 
And then we have the end of language barriers. I mean, the we're going to see automated translation. Service, which is currently in development I mean, this is, again, sounds like rocket science, but it's working right now. Right? In this, this 2011. Dirk, my staff at the company's research center in Yokosuka read a newspaper article in Japanese, which was then interpreted in real time and sent to the receiver at the exhibition hall. This was achieved by the integration of a range of existing... Well, Japan, of course, you know, they're cutting edge on this, but the Google Labs have similar things. You can speak in German, comes out in Chinese in real time. What will that do for TV shows? You know, being able to watch a TV show in live sync, right? not just a subtext, but actually synchronized. Right? Maybe lose some jobs there, I'm not sure. <laughs> this, it won't be quite that perfect for some time. But I mean, imagine we're, we're switching from a text culture to a screen culture. As Kevin Kelly says, who is the co-founder of Wired and the chief maverick, he calls himself there now, uh, he says we're going from a, from a generation of people of the book to people of the screen. And if, you, you know, if you're in any big city, Hong Kong, or wherever you are, you're looking at when you're, when you're taking a cab, you're looking at the front, there's like five or six screens in the front. Right? There's a Facebook screen, there's a television probably, there's some sort of map. You know. So we're becoming people of the screen, and, and people of the screen, of course, like kids you know, using iPads or any other tablet device, right, to be sure, are getting very used to this idea of touching stuff, you know, touching data. Very good news, I think, for us as creators, because there's lots and lots of new interfaces that create new ideas, you know, transmedia storytelling. Now let's see what happens when kids are using traditional media, you know, sent this video to a uh, uh, to the New York Times, right? They're, they're trying to zoom the page, which of course doesn't work, right? right? It's, <laughs> it's the behavior change, right? I mean, the key part here is not about the cool tech, it's about how our behaviors has changed. For example, take the simple fact of trusting strangers. Right? Before you came to this event, you know, you can probably go to my Facebook page or, or my LinkedIn page. I mean, I think all of you are on LinkedIn, it's like, Asking who's on Facebook is like asking who's going to go to the bathroom later. You know, it's like everyone, of course. Right? But you can look at my LinkedIn page, and even though I'm a stranger, you can develop a quick feel of what I do, or like my Twitter stream, very quickly. It may be fake to some degree, but not entirely. Right? So trusting strangers is a huge thing that's happening on the web, and I think as producers and as content creators, we're now entering this phase between the old is dying kind of, you know, not so much television, but print and music, and, and the new is not quite ready to be born. In other words, we have two billion privileged people on the internet, that's us, and the other three billion, you know, India, China, Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, they're just getting online. <coughs> they're just being born as, not just as consumers, but as, as part of this whole thing, right? So as this uh, Italian philosopher says in this, uh, he calls this the interregnum, this little empty gap, right? A great variety of morbid symptoms appear. In other words, now we are, we're having, we're losing sort of the old audience and the old way of doing things, the old way of funding also, right? You can't get an advance from a publisher anymore, right? Publisher says, what are you talking about, right? I'm not selling, I'm selling electronically now, right? So there's money. Advertising on regular television or print, if you translate that to digital, it's like one cent of the money that you're going to get. Right. For, for now, right? will that shift? Yes, but we're in that hole that's stuck in the middle. Now we're all a little bit like this. We're all uh, uh, basically creating data, what I call meta content. You're commenting stuff and sending stuff back and forth. We're becoming people of the screen and people of the cloud. And in this world, there are a lot of consequences out of this, right? of this trend to social, local, mobile. That's you know, again, it's the the Facebook paradigm from the lead investor in Facebook, Kleiner Perkins. First is convergence. If you're in the TV business, you're no longer just in the TV business. You're in the games business. You have to look what happens with advertising. You're in the mobile business. Right? You're in all the adjacent businesses. There is no longer a music industry. It has converged, and that's a good thing. Right? It's all converging together. It's all coming, all digital content is going into the cloud, and it comes out like from a tab. I mean, th that's a fact. We can go back and we're saying we don't really appreciate this, you know, all our music being on YouTube without getting a lot of money for it, but that's the way it is. Are you going to go back to the horseshoe makers and say, let's not have any trains? 
that is, that's what's happening. So we have to find out business models, and I think what we have now is globalization. Anybody can compete in this environment. And it requires a new kind of collaboration. And the other thing that's happening is that many of us are feeling you know, overpowered by this all, all this stuff happening at the same time. I mean, the, the amount of stuff raining down on us is mind-boggling. And it's not going to get any better. It's going to get much, much worse. Right? Just wait for the other three billion to come online and produce TV shows. 224 major motion pictures made in America a year, 2,700 in Nollywood in Nigeria, and 4,800 in Bollywood in, in India. Right? I mean, the amount of content is mind-boggling. Just wait for the new MySpace to go online, and we'll have another look at that. So we're now living in the world where everything is becoming touchable. Uh, we can touch data. We can look at cloud or peer index to see how people are rating us, you know, our personal influence, whatever that means. Right? And it's all about this. Touching data, touching information, immersion, sharing, contribution. It's an ecosystem, right, in the true sense of the word. Finally, it's the people in the middle, the publishers, the broadcasters, the platforms, the tech people, who have to say, well, basically what's happening here is it makes the creator more important and it makes the user more important. Everything in the middle is up for discussion. That's not a bad place to be. It's just not going to be as comfortable as in the past. Do we need record labels? Yes, we do. But for what? Not to send my song around the world to be sold at gas stations. So there's a different kind of thing that's happening here. I think this uh, reality really is that in this convergence, it's all about this, right? The creators and the users. It's all about that. So as a middleman, as a, you know, as a publishing company or a broadcaster, you have to think about how can you add value to both of those entities? And it'll be vastly different, at least to some degree, depending on which business you're in, than it was before. You know, creating an ecosystem is based on collaboration. I mean, ask yourself a simple question in comparison. What is the reason that we don't have electric cars today? I mean, electric cars clearly are better. Well, not clearly, but 99% <laughs> agree on that, right, that, that they could be better. The reason that we don't have it is because the entire oil energy business is based on ecosystems, right, on international cartels, right? They're not actually good for us, they're good for themselves. So for the future of, of media, what this means is that all of a sudden we're looking at having to invent how we can actually collaborate. And public media is doing this. I mean, this is clearly much more difficult for commercial media. And this is Facebook's key challenge, right? Facebook is going, uh, going from this place of where we say, well, we meet friends there, to the place of we want to make lots of money with advertising. I mean, talk about a master challenge, right? Hope you didn't buy Facebook stock. But maybe this would be a good time to, to buy it, you know, <laughs> who knows. So a new media ecosystem based on social, local, and mobile. Television of the future will be on multi-screens. People still want really good shows, of course. But they're going to start watching it in the, in the taxi on their mobile device and then switch to the tablet. At home, they're going to have an HD, and they're willing to make payments in different ways all across that food chain. But they're not going to do it if we tell them, you know, either you pay now or you can take a hike. I mean, if that's the iTunes model, that's not going to work. And it hasn't worked. It's working for me because I'm stupid enough to actually put the money in. Right? But I mean, think about this. To make it legal, I spend seven pounds to download an iTunes movie, and then I start watching, and 24 hours later, it's gone. Because right? it's allegedly telling me that I've already over, you know, overdrawn my attention span. You know, I have to pay again. I mean, wh what kind of an insult is that to, to the average user? So a new media ecosystem. That's based on the cloud. I mean, you haven't entirely noticed yet, maybe, but all of our stuff is moving to the cloud. Our music, yeah? Spotify, Simfy, Mark, RDO, you know, goes on for, for a long time, of course, YouTube, right? Our health records will move to the cloud. Our education is moving to the cloud. I mean, imagine what this will do. Every single connected person, five billion people around the globe being able to have access to all the textbooks and speeches and videos and courses of the world. I mean, that's huge right there. All moving to the cloud, now we're dealing with all these things that are happening, and this is sort of the, the menu for the future. And you can download the PDF later at uh, G. Leonhardt at my um, Twitter feed, and of course, via the website here. Each one of those points 
are essentially a marching order for the future. Anything that's social, local, mobile, cloud-centric, over-the-top, distributed, collaborative, that's where everything is going. Not to say, that I was saying earlier, right, the other stuff won't go away. We will have centralized media, we will have large broadcasters, but they are competing or going right next to the peer-to-peer -peer ecosystem. And they're becoming that system. Right? This is, of course, the saving grace of television. Now, television is merging with the internet. And that's good news. The music business is trying to stay out of the internet. Right? Look where they have gone, 74% revenue decrease in 10 years. Yeah. Fantastic strategy. So the conversions of internet and television is mind-boggling because of all the things that are happening there, not just in, the, in terms of the shows and the productions, but in all those pieces. So then we have some really cool technology coming where we have to ask the question, is this actually still what we want? Right? Is it still human, like this one? From Asheville, I'm Christian Bryant. Would you watch TV if you knew someone else was watching you? Intel is reportedly planning its own television service. Insiders say it will be a chopped down version of your standard cable service. And it will come to you through a camera equipped set top box that knows who's watching. John Anderson, you can use a Guinness right about now. Okay, so it's not going to scan your eyeballs, but it will use proprietary Intel chip tech to determine the gender and age of its current audience. Intel thinks it can provide more accurate. Now this is real, this is not science fiction, right? This is basically the television knows who you are, just like the computer or the mobile phone does, but they also know what you look like if you have a camera in television, because if you're smiling or crying or if you're a man or a woman, they will change the ads. Right? That's the idea, right? to make the ads more targeted to if you're crying, you're going to get, I guess, uh, Kleenex or whatever. Right? But, <laughs> but, you know, there's a combination of these things. It's quite mind-boggling. Look at the next one. This is Patrick. even worse. Patrick? Oh. Hi. Hi, this Daphne, is dating of tomorrow. Sorry. It's okay. You look great. Thank you. Love your jacket. Thanks. Uh, it's actually it's a uh, it's a sports jacket, so it's a lot less official than it looks. What do you mean? Uh, sorry. What's the difference between a sports jacket and a normal one? Uh, I guess a sports jacket is for people who want to look good even when they're chased by the police. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, I hope you're hungry. This yeah. place has the best burgers in town. Oh, actually I'm a vegetarian. Oh. Yeah. Really? Because you didn't say it on your profiles. Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's dating of tomorrow using augmented reality. That is reality now for, for every fighter pilot, right? So why not for dating? But the question that we have to ask for Hi. is that, is this still human? Right? Is this still human-centric or is it going to turn us into robots? Right? This is the key question I have about lots of technology, including the singularity that we're seeing discussed with Ray Kurzweil and other futurists. You know, are we still going to be human there? Or are we going to be turned into an algorithm? Anyway, we don't want this to happen. Right? We don't want to be in a place to where we're locked in with our own algorithms. That would be kind of pathetic. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen, but I think we have to keep an eye on this. Now, in terms of media, what's happening, you know, this is the Alakash Chatham in India. What's going to happen is that all access is taken over ownership. It's all about getting stuff rather than owning it. You can still buy vinyl records, and you can still buy CDs. People still do. But it's going to be uneconomic to do so in five years. Right? You will pay extra to have the printed version of the New York Times, definitely, without a doubt, in less than three years. I mean, extra in the sense of a lot extra. So if you really want to read the New York Times on the airplane, a printed edition, you can print it at the gate you know, for 20 pounds or something. Right? And people want that. Right? I mean, clearly, access, not ownership, is a fantastic innovation for all creators because it makes the content a lot more important than distribution. And distribution isn't important to us, it was only important to have it. But remember that the distributors took 90% of the money, you know, if we had a book deal. So, you know, what we're seeing here, access, not ownership, you know, tablets. I mean, tablets, as you know, are exploding. It's, it's a worldwide phenomenon, not just in Europe or in developed countries. Books going digital. Complete disembodiment everywhere. Disembodiment meaning you know, we don't have a physical thing. 
You will still have it if you want to, but you know, I'm selling a lot more Kindle books of my own books, most of my other stuff is free. Uh, you know, people getting this in digital form is better, I think, for most authors, and we have to find out what's what Kevin Kelly calls a new generative. How do we make more money with this kind of thing, creating new products? For example, apps, right? I mean, apps are clearly a way for a lot of people to say, it's the same thing on the web, but it just looks a little bit better. It has better design, I right? like work and you know, those, those kind of ideas, creating a new embodiment. So with tablets, it's really great to see that tablets plus connectivity plus social is enabling us to actually have commerce with content. As you can see, it's a little bit hard to see these slides, but people actually are consuming a huge amount of content through mobile devices. And television is next. I mean, it's already there, but now it's really grown. This is from the Business Insider, a little hard to read, but news and social networking top the scale. I mean, if you have an audience looking at this, right, they even buy content, right? <laughs> Download music, movies, magazines. <coughs> but how exactly? How exactly will that happen? This slide is uh, much more clear about this. Right? Basically, it's a combination of things. So that was clear before, right? But it's about having mobile devices, smartphones, and cheap ones, and good ones. Not iPads, right? because they're obviously not, they're, cheap, they're good but not cheap, improving broadband right? and social connectivity. I mean, the reason that I use Spotify, I don't know if you guys use Spotify, is not because the music is free, it's not free, I have to pay obviously. I mean, I could just use YouTube and use a uh, download helper, right? Or whatever you want to use there. Right? It's because I can see what my friends are listening to. That's the value to me, right? It's not the music, the music is a, is a given, you know, so whatever, 10 million songs. I can't listen to 10 million songs. I use Spotify to find out what's the added value of my friends. And now if you're looking at this, basically it's about devices and broadband and social. If you're in the media business, you know what this means, right? You have to collaborate with ISPs and operators and telecoms, right? Because they are the ones with the network and they have to collaborate with you because otherwise there's no business. I mean, the chart clearly shows it's about devices, it's about broadband, and it's about people. And of course, the content, you know, that it's all about, clearly, that's packaged in there, right? So it's about all those three things. This is why it makes no sense whatsoever to come up with uh, political rules like the three strikes, Hadopi, uh, ACTA, SOPA, PIPA, whatever other TAs we have out there, right? Because they won't solve the problem. We need business models that are collaborative things that actually generate value for the user and the creator, not for the distributor, primarily. Right? It's like asking the oil company to come in and, and invent renewable energy. I mean, clearly, they're going to want us to stick around for 20 years driving cars, right? the same cars than before. All television and media was all about this, right? Our job was to consume. That, that was our job. On mobile devices, our job is not just to consume, it's also to consume, of course, <laughs> but to engage. And there's a huge difference there, right? Engagement, right? imagine Bond with Insta paper, Instagram. I mean, this is actually already reality because he's using the iPhone with the apps for all kinds of things, mostly to blow up stuff. But anyway, our job now is to engage, to participate. And that is also the consumption. In a way, uh, Ariane Huffington said that our what we do on social networks is that what we're producing, our self-publishing, is our consumption. Right? We are the content of social networks. So basically what's happening is here that we are now getting used to the fact that every piece of media, whether it's a, a video or a movie, is reachable through a click. And that's not negotiable. We're not going to say, well, you know, you had other plans for this release window, whatever the hell that is, right? That's not going to work out in the long run. That's not negotiable. We're, I mean, two billion people aren't going to go back and say, wait, I'll check out what your rules were that you had intended for me in the first place because you know, somebody in New York decided that it would be the world that he wants to have. Right? That's not going to happen. Great, video, great cartoon about the RAA. You know, I've released a great new song. Can I hear it? No, because you know, it's protected. But scarcity is the past. I mean, to make stuff scarce just because it fits a, a paradigm of distribution, that is a pipe dream. 
So now it's curation and relevance and timeliness and all that stuff. That's the king. Your content, of course, is the king. But let's talk about a royal family rather than a king. Right? We have lots of people who are king here in different types of the world, right? depending on which way you're looking. But it's about context, relevance, format, timeliness, recommendation. It's not just about the content. In other words, it's not about distribution, it's about attention. And that's the world that we're going to. <coughs> you could argue that world may be a lot more Darwinistic, because you know, attention is even more limited than distribution, because of time. This is not a threat to television, but it potentially could be quite a change of paradigm. For tomorrow's tablet users, the social local mobile users, traditional broadcasters may just become one of the apps. An important app, but you know, imagine if I have on my smart TV 50 apps with television. You know, I have Hulu, I have Netflix, I have the BBC. I have, you know, and this is just one of the choices. I mean, democratization. I'm not sure. I mean, that, that creates a level playing field, right? And that's where we're going. Public television will have to compete with attention on all the other stuff, like you know, TED.com or Big Think or Fora, which hardly matter right now because they're not on cable or satellite. Right? But when it comes over the internet, all of a sudden, this is just basically complete conversions between television, internet, and mobile. So whatever you're going to do in the future, don't stake your career on distribution. Right? Stake your career on, on curation, on attention, on production, right? and all these things that create the value behind that technical process. And of course, it's all going to be mobile-centric. With that, I don't mean that people will necessarily consume on the mobile. They will certainly produce on the mobile, because now we have you know, DVD quality video recording on those devices. And very soon we have high-speed networks to be a broadcaster from any place in the world. But these devices are becoming remote controls. So if I connect with you here through Facebook, I can look at your playlist on Spotify. I may not actually listen to it on the device, because the network wouldn't support it necessarily if we all did this. right? But we are connected in this way. This is where the data comes from. My good friend Ross Dawson from Australia has a great chart you can download at futureexploration.net. He's talking about what's happening in news. The same thing will happen in television, with movies, and with education. The fact is that now there's many reasons why we would pay or not pay for news, for magazines, for newspapers. And those reasons are the added values. They are only the added values. They are not, in most cases, in like 98% of cases, they're not the content by it themselves. Right? They are the packaging, they're the added value. For example, I'm subscribing not to the New York Times, but to the Economist. Not because they have great writers, they, they do, and, and I, I want that, of course, right? But because they have an audio version of the Economist available, I can listen to the entire magazine in audio while I drive. That's the value for me. And if the writing was bad, I wouldn't get it. But uh, if, if there was no audio, I wouldn't get it. Right? So you tell me which one is king. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Right? It's about added values. Right? The future of content is building new values around the content, around the TV show, around the song, around the performance, around the book, around the magazine. Right? And there is a huge amount of potential if you're looking at this, like 100 things there. Personalization, timeliness, novelty. A couple examples. The opera, right? the Met, you can watch in, in cinemas around America and I think around the world now. You can actually be in the opera while it's playing in New York in real time, live stream. It's timeliness. I, I can, of course, I can watch it on video, right? but I can go somewhere and pay 10 bucks and be in the opera, but I'm going to be in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. People do this. I mean, it's, it's a huge revenue stream. The Kindle. Right? What is the value of the Kindle? It's not the book. I mean, if you want a free book, you can just go to a Russian book site right? and download a dot, dot .mobi file for any book you want. Because it syncs very nicely with my Kindle devices. I pay for that. Right? I don't actually pay for the book. Right? And that's just some of the things that I pay for. Spotify Friends, Björk mentioned before, Layar, which allows people to scan newspapers and magazines and find digital objects on the page and zoom up information from the page. It's like a bridge between digital and otherwise the economist. Of course, social television. 
Kevin Kelly calls this the new generative. You want to have a job in the future? Pick any one of those and invent something around it. I mean, it's clear <coughs> that is, th that's our marching order. I mean, look at this graph. It's already old. Internet, mobile versus desktop, it's actually going to happen in less than two years or probably in, in a year now that we're going to have more people on mobile devices than on desktops. Right? I mean, if your website isn't mobile, you're in deep trouble. Right? Every single brand is moving to mobile websites. Every artist, every author, right? I mean, clearly that's a trend that we're going to see here. Mobile spells the end of attention monopolies for television, radio, and print. And on the flip side, it spells the end of disruption for marketers. I mean, you're not going to accept that when you're on your mobile phone, they're going to give you useless ads while you're walking around just because you have it on. Right? That's not going to be acceptable. So we have to reinvent advertising. You know, if you're in an advertising business, that's just part of the same equation here. We're now living in a world like this, and it sounds, it looks rather strange, uh, given that you know this feels sort of the human machine kind of idea. But clearly, these people are the people formerly known as consumers. I mean, it's inevitable. That's us. So how can we service those people formerly known as consumers with exactly the same that we used to do 15 years ago with some sort of Band-Aid on it? Right? Isn't going to happen. Today is all about real time. I mean, this is the Twitter syndrome, right? You're not interested when you go to New York what restaurant was the best in the last five years. You may be interested in that depending on what you want to eat, right? But that's what you're going to get from the Guide Michelin or maybe even from Google search, right? You want to find out the hottest sushi place in London? You go to search.twitter.com and people are reviewing uh, sushi places and when you get there, they're still sitting there eating. Right? <laughs> that's called real time. Right? Everything is moving to real time. I mean, it's mind boggling what's happening there and I think media has to follow this as well. The great thing about public media, however, is that as this ad says, the joy of not being sold anything. That's also a very special thing. You know, we can't always at every turn have business models based on advertising. Right? I mean, clearly that would kill us unless the advertising is really good. So public media, I think, is also really about that. You know, getting something that is commercially maybe neutral in, in some way or not there yet or not supported by a commercial message. But the bottom line is now, if you like it or not, and many of us don't like this, right? We're living now in a system with many wheels, right? in an ecosystem. Show this graph to a record company guy, you know, not the people who are actually doing the work, but the lobbyists, right? They're like, no, 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 wait, we are the wheel. Right? We are the only wheel that counts and there's four of us. That's it. Right? That, we're not going back to this. We're going to a world of interdependence, right? to where we have to create value together. The creators, the publishers, the distributors, the users even. Great movie by, Tim, by uh, Tiffany Schlein called Connected, that you can, I think it's actually out in the UK as well. Uh, she's talking about how we have to declare our interdependence now, not our independence. Right? How we have to actually hyper collaborate, not hyper compete. I mean, if you're looking at those differences, independence, MTV versus YouTube, who is more important now? I mean, it's a rhetorical question. They're still making money at MTV and Viacom, right? But YouTube is. You know, it's, it's a global broadcasting venue. It's, it's a completely different ball game. And if you're looking at iTunes versus Spotify and Android, the New York Times versus The Guardian and Henry Ford versus Electric Cars. I mean, independ interdependence is a different business model, but this is where we're going. I mean, clearly, that is the shift that we're going to see this evaporate between those two different things. APIs, for example, right? APIs are the symptom of this interdependence. This is why it's so important to have open APIs and to have ways to exchange data. 
and the BBC has been very, very good at, at uh, harvesting that information, and of course also the Guardian. Yeah. So my book, Ego to Ego, which is coming out sometime next year, will be for free. Um, this is one of the key drawings, and I didn't actually make this, I found this on Tumblr, and I, I have no idea who made this, but it's a perfect fit with my theory. <laughs> right? So whoever it is, thank you out there. Um, television and computers that were largely based on ecosystems. You know, big broadcasters, distribution arrangements, HBO, licensing agreements, Netflix, da da da. Right? The future as an ecosystem will be based on a collaborative, like a biosphere, right? where those kind of systems have to be nurtured, right? And of course, they're going to converge. This is a thing I got from the Wall Street Journal how the, the movie industry is trying to protect their assets from piracy, and it's like a mole whacking exercise. Right? because clearly it's not, not working, right? The ecosystem is all about distribution, and is that good for creators? Definitely not, because it creates all of the pressure at the loophole of making copies, whether it's a download digital one or, or a physical one. Right? Now we're talking about an ecosystem that is based on attention. And they can very well overlap, you know, not the molds, but the other stuff. Television? YouTube is now starting to fund productions, commissioning productions. And that's going to be true for all of the major social networks, Facebook, Twitter, all the other ones. And it cannot possibly compete, of course, with public funding, <laughs> right? But it's another avenue. I mean, think about Kickstarter. You guys know Kickstarter, right? I mean, not every project can be funded on Kickstarter. I mean, I get 50 invitations a day now to spend money on Kickstarter. Right? That's also going to be important, but it's not a real solution. Not money-wise either, right? But we're going to see basically here that many producers will have many new ways to reach their audiences. Is that bad for television? I don't think so. I think the combination really works out well if you can have both. Right? I mean, making the leap from YouTube, being a channel on YouTube to Discovery Channel, or so a lot of people are doing this already this way. I think it's very hopeful for producers like myself, being a hobby film producer, is a way to reach an audience. On my YouTube channel, I can reach that audience even with my shitty video, people are watching it, right? So it's not a bad thing. We're moving from centralized media to open content ecosystems, from the media that it has to be controlled to be distributed and licensed to an open content ecosystem. And of course, the BBC is a driving force behind both of these. Right? It's kind of an interesting scenario that we're seeing that shift towards open social television, I mean, look at all these companies who are engaged in social television, which is, you know, using a tablet to communicate while you watch the show. Very popular in the UK, not so much in Switzerland or Germany yet. I mean, mind-boggling the ecosystem that's unfolding around electric cars as a, as a side note, you know, it requires hyper-collaboration because how am I going to have an electric car if I don't have a way to, f to fuel up somewhere? I mean, I drive 100 miles and then I'm dead. I need a gas station, an electric gas station. I need an ecosystem. It's going to be exactly the same. If you want to sell direct as a producer, you need an ecosystem. Otherwise, you go dead after 100 miles. So that ecosystem is now being unfolded. A quick talk about piracy. To a large extent, we've spent the last 15 years barking up the wrong tree. Right? Basically saying, OK, what's very, very important for us is to control distribution. Right? The toxic assumption that I call Controlling distribution is the key to the money. Turns out, not true. What is important is not controlling attention, but having attention, having an audience and converting it. I call this the pay will versus the pay wall. Right? There's so many companies who have been successful, like Netflix with this. Right? Can't figure out how people would, anybody would think that you can force people to pay. I mean, I always say forcing people to pay on the internet is like forcing to love. Good luck. Right? You can try, you know, but unless you pay, there's no way of doing that. So, <laughs> yeah, it's like a reverse payment scenario. So, people pay for value, brand, and trust. I mean, look at all the stuff that people are paying for online, right? I mean, if anybody tells you people aren't willing to pay for content, I don't know, they've lived under a rock for the last five years, right? I mean, from the New York Times to The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, Amazon, Hulu, Netflix, and, and LinkedIn, and what have you. All of you guys are on LinkedIn. Who's actually paying for LinkedIn? Who's paying to use LinkedIn as a premium user? Oh, you guys are cheap. No, they're stupid. 5% <laughs> of LinkedIn users are paying, creating $500 million a year. The freemium model. I mean, this is clearly working. 
And I would propose to you that if we do this, we put up this wall and we say, you're going to climb over the wall, you're going to put in a coin, or you can take a hike. Most of us will take a hike. I mean, clearly it's a question of how much money you have, but the problem is not the pay, it's the wall. Let's figure out a more reasonable model to get people to accept that there's money at the other end. It's not that hard, right? It's called upselling. Look at the games business. $22 billion revenues last year. How did they get there? Make it free. And then you pay later. It's not that hard of a model. Right? I mean, it's clearly working hard to do when you make a movie for 500,000 pounds. Right? How are you going to get the money for that? Right? Of course, there's more machinations behind that. But trust is this currency that drives economy, the creative economy. Is not control. Right? When, when control drives the economy, it's going to end up with just a few people in the middle. We have to skip ahead a little bit. Uh, quick word about Facebook. Facebook is cable TV without the cable and shows without studios. And they just reach, uh, reached a billion users. I mean, clearly what we're going to see is that you know, Facebook is sucking up every fourth minute of attention on the Internet. Yesterday, 27.6 billion minutes, to which I contributed like one. Right? And, and so now you have brands thanking people you know, for actually doing this. I mean, we don't have time to watch this video, but uh, check it out. It's a craft a macaroni brand hired a band to sing a song to people that like them. Just give me two seconds of this clip. He was on Facebook browsing alone, hungry for a change when he stumbled upon our page. He clicked like on her post, he was so very kind. All of you are of a very similar mind. Now you gotta check it out on YouTube. It's, it's like a love song to people who like me on Facebook. And this is sort of showing you what's happening, what I call Lycanomics. There's a great book with that title, not for me, but it's called Lycanomics if you want to read a good book. And Facebook's job, if they accept it, and is to reinvent both media and advertising. This is why there's so much trouble around Facebook right now. None of this was ever done before. Right, this is Mark's message to all the users, which I think they will do. They become a major avenue of distribution. I'm going to skip this. Just a quick word on this. I am much more confident that we will have in the future both the skimping along the surface that we do with digital media as well as the immersion. We have both. We're not going to get stuck with that skimping stuff, you know, just to waste time on it because we have an attention span of a gnat, you know. That's not going to be our future. I think it's temporary. So I'm not so worried about this part of it. We're going to actually want both. We're going to want the immersion, the privacy, and the offline, your offline is the new luxury now, right? And we want to get connected to the cloud. We want both. We just have to find a way to be responsible with the two. I'm going to skip ahead here so we can get to the summary and don't get more signals from the back here. As you can see, I was preparing to be around for uh, the next few hours. <laughs> so uh, I'll publish this PDF later. Here's a quick summary. I propose to you build this arc now if you're, if you're in a television business or in a content business. And of course, the fact that you're here, you're very well positioned to do so. Uh, otherwise, you would go to Monaco Media Forum or some place like that. We're moving from an ego system to an ecosystem. Right? Again, not in the sense of green, but in the sense of interconnected, right? relying on each other to come up with new models. And this is a model that we have to figure out based on this, what people are doing, social, local, mobile, tablets. Right? That is where everything is moving. And television is converging with this. I mean, Talking about a huge opportunity. All is moving into the cloud. Will we need people to have cable and satellite? Yes, for a while, because it's working well. Right? I mean, try to get a live broadcast of a, of a, of a soccer game with 300 million people watching is not going to happen over mobile phones. Right? Not yet. Right? So we need both for a while. The wheels. Right? We're now part of other wheels. You want to be your only wheel, then you know, be Apple. I mean, I love Apple stuff, but you know, try to copy that, you know, good luck. You know. So maybe Richard Benson can do it, I don't know. The ship of control is sinking, we have to accept this. It's not going to be about control, it's going to be about engagement. It's going to be about people saying, yes, I'm ready to pay for X, Y, Z that you produce. About, it's going to be about the new generatives, immediacy, authenticity, interpretation, embodiment. Right, that's a great business model for the future.
And first and foremost, it's not about us. I mean, unless you are both, you know, in my case, I'm both. Right? It's about the creators and the users. So whatever business model we cook up has to be based on what they need, not what we need. And that is a substantial difference to what we had in the past. The entire media business was based on the needs of distributors. So that change, I think, to me, constitutes a new ecosystem, which I will find very exciting in the future. Thanks very much for your time. You can ask questions later using AskGerd, a hashtag, right? or just Twitter me or download my app and ask me questions to this. And thanks very much. Brilliant. Fantastic.